Again, my name is Dan Sheffield. I'm the interim director of the Ron Center, uh, so I get to uh, sit back and enjoy all of the labors that the, the normal director of the Ron Center has done in arranging this wonderful lecture series that we have um, for this semester. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome our speaker all the way from Denver, Colorado, uh, for today's talk. Uh, our speaker today is Alex Boudroukas, uh, who is a, a recently minted PhD and a, a even more recently uh, hired assistant professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Uh, Alex is part of a you know cutting edge uh, group of scholars who work on the history of, uh, of the Gulf, of labor and migration in one of the world's you know largest uh, uh, patterns of, of circulation of labor um, anywhere uh, in, in the present day. Uh, today, Alex is going to be uh, delivering a, a, a lecture that's drawn from his uh, work in progress, a book manuscript. Uh, today's lecture is entitled Comrades Estranged, the Struggle for Citizenship uh, in the 20th Century uh, Persian Gulf. And before Alex gets started, just a few words, uh, 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 a reminder. Uh, Alex will be speaking for about half an hour, 35 minutes, something in, in this vicinity. Yeah? Uh, after which we'll have uh, some time for questions and answers. Uh, as I uh, said already uh, last week, anyone who has a burning question, you know, even during the talk, please catch my eye and I'll try to get you on a, on a list of, uh, of, of question askers. Uh, I ask again uh, that you, if you have a question, that it actually is a question uh, that you ask and not a, a lengthy uh, comment uh, or mini lecture of your own. And further, I ask that you only ask a single question. I'm not going to point my finger at anyone who asked two questions last week, but uh, but because uh, that you know event has been erased from memory. But but please limit yourself to one question. If you have a follow up to a question that's been asked, uh, you know. Please raise maybe both of your hands so I know it sort of take you and have you cut the line of, of, of uh, question askers. But without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Alex Budrukas uh, uh, for today's lecture. Um, hi. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me OK? OK, great. Uh, I'll try to project so everyone can. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, thank you, uh, Becky, for arranging, uh, arranging all of this uh, and for the invitation. It's great to uh, see new people and some uh, people I haven't seen in too long. So um, it's great to be here. Um, so yes, today I'm presenting on what's basically my, uh, my manuscript in progress, which is a very, very heavily revised, uh, heavily updated version of what was my dissertation. Um, this is actually the first time I'm presenting it for a variety of kind of COVID and other reasons. So um, feedback or comments are very much appreciated. Um, so I'm going to start by kind of laying out some of the broader arguments and interventions of the work. And then I'm going to delve into kind of one particular example. It's actually an excerpt from one of the kind of uh, later core chapters of the work. Um, so uh, I began this project uh, almost a decade ago now to answer a pretty big and fundamental question. So why is the majority of the Persian Gulf's population non-citizen? How does this happen? And not only non-citizen, but also non-citizens who are generally denied the opportunity of gaining nationality, who are exempted from many of the protections of labor law, and who are subject to the full and really unrestrained power of the deportation state. So I, I try to provide an answer to this question by examining how struggles over citizenship and the economy and labor transformed the 20th century Persian Gulf with a focus on Kuwait. You'll notice that I'm very much focusing on what we now call the GCC states and especially the smaller GCC states. Um, so the, the project begins uh, with the British imperial imposition of the region's first nationality laws in the 1920s, really actually with the rise of the deportation state in the 19-teens. And it ends with the suspension of the Kuwaiti constitution in 1976. So it therefore covers a series of pretty dramatic transformations in, in the region. The onset of the oil age, the rise of mass migration and mass politics, mass political movements, uh, and the coming era of decolonization. It addresses the, the Persian Gulf region as a whole, but it becomes kind of more and more focused on Kuwait as politics come to be delineated by the boundaries of the nation state. Uh, it follows the struggle over three essential questions that I argue really kind of dominated the politics of the mid-century Persian Gulf during this period. So number one, who should be granted nationality? Number two, what should citizenship mean? And number three, what rights should non-citizens living in the polity be granted? I, I argue that these three questions are absolutely essential and inextricably connected. So to avoid reifying the category of quote unquote migrant by treating migrants as a predetermined object of study, 
The project tries to trace the history of a relationship, so the line between citizens and non-citizens, and the wide-ranging effects of that relationship. So specifically, it tries to explain how, quote unquote, these migrant workers are produced as such, as deportable, as non-citizen, and as excised from the body politic. In fact, I think the term migrant itself is something of a, of, of a misnomer, because many so-called migrants have actually lived in the region for generations. You'll notice I, I will prefer the terms citizen and non-citizen uh, in this talk and in the manuscript. Um, it, uh, migrant, as, as, as others have also pointed out, is also somewhat uh, of a dismissive, con uh, uh, a dismissive term. In fact, migrants don't just pass through Gulf space, but they're actually profoundly shaping it in this time period. So by historicizing this figure, right, this kind of idea of the migrant worker, I try to highlight the contingencies of its production and challenge these assumptions of, of temporariness. So answering these three big questions requires a rethinking of some of the central tropes of Gulf studies. And here I'm, I'm trying to contribute to a broader literature. Um, I argue that the field of, of Persian Gulf studies has long been in the grip of two discourses of economic inevitability. So the first is rentier theory, which for three decades has, I would argue, been kind of the dominant theoretical framework to which many social scientists have understood the region. So in brief, it argues, and this will be very familiar to a number of you, but it, it, it argues that uh, oil rents enable resource states to quote unquote buy off the political, uh, the political opposition by providing things like government jobs and extensive social services. So this argument is often phrased in the language of exchange, right? Material affluence in exchange for political quiescence. Now there's been a lot of recent work that's complicated the story. Um, a number of scholars have kind of started to turn away from this framework, but I still argue um, that it has remained a kind of dominant framework in the field uh, that has shaped the, the, the creation of, of, of knowledge about the region. Um, in the end, I think, even with kind of recent nuances, the rentier state framework posits oil as an overpowering structural variable that steamrolls historical agency uh, and human, uh, hu historical contingency, excuse me, and human agency. So fundamentally, it's a narrative of path dependency, right? Oil and the state are all powerful actors in this story. And at worst, residents of the Gulf, and especially citizens of the Gulf, end up being framed as the recipients of unearned and, and presumably undeserved wealth, which has supposedly led to some kind of decline in work ethic and political engagement. And this is the narrative I am pushing back against. And I'm happy to talk more about um, a number of recent scholars have been doing this as well, and I'm seeking to kind of contribute to that pushback. The second prominent, dis prominent discourse of economic inevitability is deployed to explain the rise of mass migration. So migration to the Gulf is often understood in terms of neoclassical economics, invariably following these kind of push and pull incentives in a global market for labor. The story is pretty familiar. So with the oil rush and the concurrent construction boom, the region faced a labor shortage and so turned abroad, right? So in this narrative, labor is framed almost like a natural resource, like it's oil or water that the, that the region kind of intrinsically lacked um, and so ha it had to be obtained more economically elsewhere. So I think the dominance of these discourses of economic inevitability go a long way to explaining why histories of citizenship and of popular protest in particular are sidelined in many discussions of the Persian Gulf. Right? There's no reason to study the history of either if the result is framed as economically inevitable right? or, or unavoidable in some way. And if the rentier state is the, the dominant actor in this story, there's really no reason to take the agency of ordinary people seriously. And I think even with pushback against the rentier state framework, we've basically had a generational neglect of popular protest and social history in the Persian Gulf. So this manuscript tries to overturn both of these economistic discourses. So first, by, by tracing the contested political history of citizenship in the middle of the century, it tries not just to escape, but to actually reverse the rentier narrative. The manuscript argues that the benefits of the welfare state, things like, like universal health care, education, social security, and housing, aren't the free gifts of benevolent, benevolent autocrats or the result of some kind of cynical ploy to buy off the opposition. These benefits had to be won. They are the hard-fought victories of a prolonged political struggle during which a diverse array of popular movements fought for what T.H. Marshall has called social citizenship, or the idea that, that citizens have the right to a basic quality of life. Gulf citizens didn't uniformly seek to narrow the bounds of nationality so as to take a larger share of the oil wealth for themselves, as, as is often presumed. But instead, uh, the historical record shows that many fought for reform and inclusivity in the name of social justice. The manuscript also attacks this idea of the inevitability of mass migration by challenging the, the meanings of both supply and demand in the context of migration in the Gulf. It argues that these quote unquote migrant workers are perpetually in demand, not because of an absolute short of laboring bodies, but precisely because they were produced as migrant workers, right? Because employers preferred them because they were easier to underpay, to intimidate, 
to fire, and to deport. In the Gulf, as elsewhere, exclusion and cheapness are a historical choice. In this case, uh, a choice that was led by imperial, corporate, and state elites to exclude non-citizens from the protections of labor law and union organizing and to deal with labor shortages basically by, by searching for more workers abroad instead of making jobs more appealing and better paid at home. So in the final analysis, demand in the Persian Gulf isn't just for labor. It's for cheap and deportable non-citizen labor. And both deportability and cheapness are the result of a contingent political struggle. And that is one of the struggles I try to trace in this manuscript. So to narrate this struggle, the manuscript follows basically two broad arcs. So the first is a story, a very imperial story, of British imperial officials, um, multinational oil companies, usually Anglo-American oil companies, um, mercantile elites, and their kind of local allies, who more often than not, even though they squabble a lot, tend to find that their interests coincide. Uh, they work to forge a narrow and hierarchical conception of both citizenship and nationality in order to tr entrench their political and economic power. Now, the second arc uh, traces popular responses to these efforts as anti-colonial movements, feminists, pro-democracy activists, and especially workers organized in the defense of a more egalitarian vision of citizenship and a more inclusive conception of nationality and even greater rights for non-citizens living within the, po the polity. So I argue that the meanings of both citizenship and of denizenship, or the rights of non-citizens, are forged in tandem as activists and organizers fought for a more equitable distribution of economic wealth and political power. So it wasn't inevitable that, say, residency would be tied to work visas, or that the path to citizenship would be entire, almost entirely foreclosed, or even that non-citizens would be denied civic rights and workplace protections. Uh, I actually argue instead that citizens fought for the rights of non-citizens in this period, and that the rights of citizens proved inextricable from the rights of non-citizens in this period. So to write this, this story that's, that's very much centered on struggle and contestation, um, I tried to use kind of underutilized sources and highlight the role of uh, hitherto ignored popular movements, who I argue are, are much more significant than, than they've been given credit for in the historiography. So I do use a lot of English language imperial sources and corporate sources, especially from like the, the British Petroleum, or actually bank records proved really helpful. Um, but really, uh, the primary source base for this manuscript, for really the, the last two thirds of the manuscript, um, were Arabic language sources. They were oral history interviews, um, memoirs, and especially, especially newspapers, all of which are produced in the Gulf. There's an incredibly rich archive, especially in Kuwait, that I, that I do quite heavily from. These represent far and away the best and often the only sources of information on Gulf politics, and especially during the pretty critical years, 1952 to 1976. These have not just provided valuable information for me, but they've also shaped the narrative and arguments of this work. They're far different than, than much of the secondary literature. The central actors in this manuscript are popular movements. Uh, it, pr it prominently features Arab nationalists, feminists, Marxists, and pro-democracy and anti-colonial activists. But I argue that actually the single most significant and revealing popular movement here is the Kuwaiti labor movement, which has been almost entirely ignored in the historiography. By leveraging the power to shut down oil production, Kuwaiti oil workers in particular actually emerged as some of the most powerful actors in Kuwaiti politics in the 1960s and the 1970s. And for both practical and ideological reasons, labor leaders determined that they needed to organize non-citizen workers if they were going to build a powerful and durable movement. So from a practical side, if non-citizens are excluded from the labor movement, right? if they, if they can't uh, join unions, if they're banned from striking, employers can deploy them as strike breakers, right? which is going to undermine the, the power of the labor movement as a whole, including for citizen workers. Um, it also means that employers have this, this pool of structurally vulnerable and underpaid people to, to, to draw on, meaning that Kuwaiti workers are at a disadvantage in the labor market. right? It affects the entire wage structure. Um, now, from a more kind of ideological or ethical perspective, oil workers have been grappling for years with the blat blatantly racist and segregationist policies of Anglo-American oil companies in the region. I talk about this more elsewhere. Um, but uh, this means that workers and their leadership end up adopting this very strong anti-colonial and anti-discrimination line. So they allied with, with Arab nationalists and anti-colonial nationalists to oppose discrimination on the basis of nationality. And actually, they, they went so far as to repeatedly describe it as another form of racism. This was a common argument at the time. Uh, the result was that Kuwaiti unions would, kind of almost by accident, emerge as some of the most powerful and vocal supporters of non-citizen rights in the 20th century Persian Gulf. They also became the connecting tissue between more radical movements, and this is a time when there's multiple Marxist revolutions going on in the region, um, and they're, they're connecting many of these more radical movements to mainstream politics at the time. So it was workers and anti-colonial nationalist allies who deployed the category of labor to battle for and at times win 
thicker and richer conceptions of both citizenship and denizenship. So their story provides an antidote to these narratives of economic inevitability and, real, and, and show how ordinary people in the Gulf fought for a more just and equitable future. So that is kind of the broader arc and arguments of the work. Um, today, I'm going to delve more into one particular section. I'm really going to look at debates over naturalization and, uh, and, and immigration law in the 1970s in, in Kuwait. Uh, by the 70s, I'm, I'm, uh, the manuscript is very focused on Kuwait. But before I do that, I need to briefly give you a, a breakdown of the history of Kuwaiti nationality law, which is more interesting than I promised it sounds like. Um, uh, so to begin with, um, by the 1970s, uh, Kuwaiti nationality law is based on legislation passed in 1959. And, and what's a key point here, this is before Kuwaiti independence. This is a law drafted by Egyptian legal advisors um, and, um, uh, and with the support of British imperial officials. The law is itself based on other nationality laws in uh, the, the broader Arabic-speaking world, but particularly in the Persian Gulf. And those laws were drafted by British imperial officials on the basis of kind of their own thoughts of what nationality would look like. So this is a nationality law um, basically draft, uh, based entirely on British imperial legislation. Um, uh, it was drafted by imperial authorities to kind of uh, reinforce their own position in the Gulf, and to be perfectly blunt, to make it easier to legally deport people. Uh, this is why the first nationality laws are passed. Their mechanisms of exclusion. Actually, there's a lot of good work on the, 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 the Palestine Mandate period in the 1925 Ordering Council that, the, that was the used. Uh, kind of, it was kind of a similar story. It was passed, to, passed for reasons of exclusion. Same story in the Gulf. Um, now, this legislation in 1959 dramatically reduces access to Kuwaiti nationality. It's based on dissent. Being born in Kuwait does not give you nationality. You have to be descendant from somebody who lived in Kuwait from the year 1920. Um, it also divided citizens into two categories. So you had first tier citizens with full rights. Second tier citizens had no civic or voting rights. And I so should also know women were not granted voting rights until 2005. So they effectively are their own category in this time period. It also made it very hard for non-citizens to be naturalized, for new, new arrivals to be naturalized. It tied the nationality of women's to, women to their husbands. This is actually a uh, common practice in the middle of the century, also in Anglo-American uh, immigration law. It's not just a Gulf thing. Um, and it placed a variety of restrictions on non-citizen residents. It's paired with other legislation at the time that does this as well. Um, so uh, to receive nationality, Kuwaiti citizens have to apply to these things called, called nationality committees, which have these very strict requirements of what you need, evidence-wise, in order to become a Kuwaiti national. So it's, it's a really restrictive law. Now this law um, uh, would, have, would be uh, amended after independence in 1965, and it would actually become even stricter. It would become harder to become a Kuwaiti national. The number of people who could be naturalized every year was capped, and that number was extremely low. Um, and so uh, you have a very, restrictive, um, a very restrictive nationality system at this point in time. I also want to highlight both of these laws are passed during periods of time when the regime is cracking down on dissent. Uh, this is not a coincidence. Every major piece of Kuwaiti nationality law in this period was passed when the pro-democracy op opposition was being actively suppressed. And many of them kind of flew against public opinion and public debate in the press at the time. Uh, these are very much regime projects that are imposed from above. Now, to further situate this discussion a little bit in the context of the manuscript, um, uh, another chapter uh, uh, at rough, covers roughly the same time period, but, but focuses how the labor on, on how the labor movement grappled with the question of citizenship. Um, and specifically, during a series of strikes in the, 19, the 1970s, when actually citizenship and discrimination based on nationality became really key points. Um, beginning in the late 1960s, the regime and its corporate allies, really led by these Anglo-American oil companies, were trying to drive a wedge between citizen and non-citizen workers by granting special privileges to Kuwaitis. Now, these came in a variety of forms. Um, they got priority in hiring and firing decisions. Um, uh, but the, the, the really big important thing um, that financially mattered a lot was the granting of allowances to Kuwaiti workers and to a Kuwaiti workers only. So they were basically granted special pay at this point in time. Interestingly. Workers, including Kuwaiti citizens, actually fought back against this policy of granting special privileges to Kuwaitis. And there were a number of strikes in the 1970s where this was actually a central point of contention, where workers argued this was discriminatory, it's a tool to divide the working class, and that they weren't going to ag agree with it. So as this press debate that I'm about to describe is unfolding, there are also a series of strikes where nationality and discrimination based on nationality are one of the central issues, especially in the oil industry, which is uh, uh, very, uh, in, uh, from a terms of nationality, very diverse. Um, and where workers of different nationalities were often working together in the oil field. So oil workers are really central here. Uh, but here what I'm going to talk about is, is this press debate in the early 1970s in Kuwait. 
So the reopening of political debate in 1970 in Kuwait, which followed a, a rigged election and this crackdown on dissent, revived the debates over nationality. So reflecting the mood of wider Gulf politics at the time, the debate reached an unprecedented level of radicalism and urgency. So by 1972, one newspaper was actually describing this flurry as the, quote, naturalization movement, or Harakat de Tejnis. An array of actors called for sweeping reforms to, quote, open the door to naturalization, which challenged some of the fundamental premises of the Kuwaiti nationality regime. Many called actually simultaneously for a reform of both nationality and residency legislation. These were seen as linked at the time. They urged kind of a more humane system of, migra of immigration, residency, and naturalization that would not only redress a string of injustices that I'll talk about in a minute, but also allow Kuwait to retain much needed, many much needed workers as the oil rush at this exact same time is generated an uh, generating an unprecedented construction boom. Right? This is the early 1970s, the oil crisis in the United States, oil boom in the Persian Gulf, right? So this connection, uh, this connection that was drawn between nationality and, re and, and, uh, and residency, though, also had its dangers. By highlighting the connection between the rights of citizens and of non-citizens, advocates of nationality reform would find themselves confronting a powerful set of actors for whom exclusion was a useful political weapon and even a source of profit. So by 1970, the flaws in Kuwaiti national, nationality legislation had become glaring. And actually, even government officials were acknowledging this themselves. The head of the passport office at the Ministry of Social Affairs in Kuwait, which is actually the, the office that was enforcing all of these laws, actually um, supported a reform nationality law. He said that the rigid requirements in place meant that his nationality committees actually had to turn down people who they thought were deserving of nationality, right? The legislation was so strict that even the people enforcing it were becoming skeptical. In fact, nationality had itself generated a lot of the tension between the government and the opposition at this point in time. It was becoming increasingly clear that during this crackdown on dissent in the late 1960s, the regime had illegally naturalized tens of thousands of people, usually from among the Bedouin population, in the hope of creating a loyalist voting bloc. It was basically a system of patronage. So the corruption of this nationality system, in other words, was being used to undermine democracy. Now, these abuses were accompanied by increasing awareness of the devastating human impact of these nationality laws. So in 1970, a man named Ahmed Mohammed Ahmed, who was actually a stateless person, attempted to take his own life after years of struggling to find stable employment. Another attempted suicide the following year uh, generated uh, even more sympathetic newspaper coverage. Critics also highlighted the seeming arbitrariness, injustice, and just uh, randomness of the nationality committees. So one man claimed his, his application for nationality was rejected because he had failed to identify the position of the Shemlan well, like a specific well within the city of Kuwait. Uh, another said that his denial resulted from his inability to pinpoint the location of all of the donkey stables in old, old Kuwait to prove that he'd been living in Kuwait for many years. So this very exasperated man explained that he didn't know because he'd never owned a donkey, right? Um, but these have real significant imp impacts, right, on people's lives. Um, now, given the fact that nationality is supposed to be based on descent, um, uh, this, this means that the case of split families, right, in which you know, a sibling or one person would be granted nationality and someone else wouldn't, um, were uh, generated a particularly large amount of sympathy and indignation. So uh, actually, a number of members of parliament, in this, in, even in the very first years of the 1970s, proposed amendments to the nationality law that were designed to unify the citizenship status of families. So advocates of reform centered their arguments on what I, what, I, what I find to be four sympathetic figures whose exclusion from the national community was deemed particularly unjust. So in, in part, these are tropes or constructs, but they do reflect the experience of, of actual individuals whose lives were profoundly disrupted by their exclusion from Kuwaiti nationality. Um, so one of the most popular figures was the, resident, the long resident Arab expert, who's kind of Kuwaiti in all but name, has lived there for many years, but does not have Kuwaiti nationality. In the women's press in particular, a second sympathetic figure are the descendant of Kuwaiti women and non-Kuwaiti men. Because nationality passes through the male line, these children are stateless, right? So there are actually a lot of stateless people being born in Kuwait at this point in time. Um, the, uh, the, the third uh, kind of sympathetic figure of the stateless person is the, uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, the stateless high school graduate. Um, so by the early 1970s, more and more stateless young people uh, are, are graduating from high school and finding that they lack the paperwork required to go on to higher education, to get a job, to get married, to access public benefits, to leave the country, or even to legally reside in Kuwait, right, which has been their home their entire lives, and they have no other legal recourse, right? Um, 
their impossible position led even pro-regime and quite conservative publications to call for their naturalization. Now, the final figure is the kind of Bedouin soldier or Bedouin police officer who is, who is stateless after many years of service. Uh, and this figure also proved quite, uh, quite appealing to even conservatives or pro-regime people um, who were otherwise skeptical of uh, the ethical arguments made uh, by the reformers. Now, some of the most compelling testimony came from stateless people themselves. In the early 1970s, Kuwaiti newspapers published a slew of testimonials on the personal impact of what one person called the harsh and merciless nationality law. One woman, uh, who was very vehement that she was not a foreigner, uh, explained that her father had died in the early 1950s, before he could register as a Kuwaiti national at all, before the nationality committees are even created in the, 19th, uh, the late 50s, early 60s, um, and, and that had rendered her stateless, right, by no fault of her own, right? Um, many felt that an essential part of their kind of sense of self was being denied, and they feared expulsion from a country where they had lived their entire lives, right? Uh, a typical or unu but unusually detailed story is that of a man named uh, Abdullah Suleiman Muhammad. So he was a former sailor who, as a youth, had actually worked for one of the best known Nahudas or boat captains in Kuwait. Um, and then when the Kuwait oil company began operations, he went and worked as a contractor in the oil fields. This is a classic story, by the way. A lot of Kuwaitis, you know, the, oil, uh, the, the, the sailing and, and pearling industry are a big thing. They start to collapse just as oil emerges. So this is kind of a classic Kuwaiti story. Um, and over the years, he bounced around jobs and actually ended up working for many of the most prominent people and institutions within inside Kuwait. So he worked for Sheikh Salem uh, as a driver for the Ministry of Water and Electricity, the Planning Council, um, the Kharafi Group, which is a big business organization, uh, and eventually for the newspaper al Ra'i Al-Am, which is why his story ends up being published. Um, but none of these... None of these employers had ever asked for proof of nationality. They just treated him as a Kuwaiti, right? He spent his entire life in Kuwait. But he had never possessed an official passport. He only had a travel permit from the pre-independence era, which, which described him as a Kuwaiti, but didn't count as legal proof of nationality. Now, for many years, this was sufficient evidence uh, of, of Kuwaitiness to get access to things like medical care or to get employment. But in the late 1960s, as the re regime starts cracking down on the, the rights granted to non-citizens, it becomes a greater and greater burden. He, he couldn't travel abroad. He feared losing his right to residency, which could be taken away at any time, right? And he struggled to get married, which is a serious issue for a lot of stateless people at this point in time. Now, he applied to the nationality committees late in 1968. And even though he had a lot of witnesses um, and a lot of support from prominent Kuwaitis, he never got a response. So his story kind of embodies the experience of many non-elite Kuwaitis who were left behind by nationality legislation. By the time it became clear that he would need official documentation, it was already too late. So supporters of a more open nationality regime paired these ethical arguments with more material ones. So they framed uh, the naturalization of, of longtime non-citizen residents as a solution for Kuwait's manpower shortage. This is the term that's just dominating the press at this point in time. This manpower shortage in the early oil years is seen as a really kind of fundamental existential thing for the Kuwaiti, the Kuwaiti economy. So this idea that large-scale naturalization could help provide economic benefits gained a lot of powerful legitimacy in late 1971 when it received the backing of Ahmed al-Daj, who was a specialist, from the a specialist on the influential planning council from the Kuwaiti government itself. So he kind of became the technocratic face of reform by publicly advocating for a loosening of nationality restrictions on economic lines. So specifically, he wanted to grant nationality to Arabs. This is a key distinction. We can, we're Happy, which I would be happy to talk about later, but Arabs born and raised in Kuwait, or to Arab technicians who have, uh, quote, valuable skills, all right, on the grounds that these new citizens would contribute to economic development and diversification, and help with what was often called the, democratic, uh, the, the, the demographic imbalance of Kuwait, another popular press trope at this point in time. The, the ratio of citizens to non-citizens, Kuwait already is a, a, a majority non-citizen resident country, was seen as a problem at this point in time. Now, now why people saw it as a problem uh, very dramatically, but um, this was seen as a potential solution to that uh, thing that was often posed as a problem. So granting nationality right, would, would solve this, this especially skilled labor shortage. I put that in air quotes. As a labor historian, every job is skilled. But this is how it was often framed in the press and at the time. Um, uh, also encourage, uh, discourage the emigration of qualified workers and help provide the kind of stability that's required for economic growth and especially for consumption, um, which a lot of Kuwaiti, uh, Kuwaiti uh, mercantile figures are really concerned with. So for people who were skeptical of the more kind of ideological or ethical arguments of a lot of the kind of reformers, um, these technocratic or uh, economic arguments were quite compelling. So al-Daj becomes a really quite important figure here in the reform mo movement. Uh, and in particular, 
His position as a state employee on the planning council meant that his ideas were, as a matter of course, reviewed by a lot of high-ranking Kuwaitis, including the council of ministers itself. Now, many supporters of a more open regime of, of na nationality and naturalization believed it should be paired with or accompanied by a system of permanent residency and the abolition of these tiers of citizenship. Now, these arguments were interrelated, and actually, they were bureaucratically inextricable. The very same office within the Ministry of Social Affairs dealt with both naturalization and with residency. So the same guy, this, this kind of bureaucratic celebrity named Suleiman Mashan, long story, but he's the guy who's kind of dealing with this. So they're bureaucratically connected. And, and many of these reformers believed that residency could serve as what was often called a bridge or a, a, a milk brother to nationality, especially for long-time, long-resident Arab specialists. So it would, it would give them a sense of stability that would help benefit the Kuwaiti economy and help, help stem what was actually, at this point in time, a strong emigration of skilled Arab workers at this point in time. It was called the reverse hijra. It's not really covered in much of the literature. I talk about it elsewhere. But many uh, long resident uh, Arab residents were leaving for actually higher pay outside of Kuwait. And this was also framed as a, as a problem at the time. Um, uh, now, uh, so this. Uh, this idea, right, of pairing reform of immigration and nationality legislation also received support of people like al-Daesh. And actually, al-Daesh himself um, compared tiered citizenship with the racist practices of states like South Africa and Rhodesia, drawing on a popular reformist comparison of discrimination based on race and discrimination based on nationality. This uh, links back to the uh, anti-colonial period and remained a very strong argument in the Kuwaiti press in this period. So this insistence on linking the rights of non-citizens, uh, of the stateless, and of second-tier citizens received, reflected kind of a widespread understanding at the time that these struggles are inextricable. I think this point was most clearly articulated actually in an interview in 1974 by a man named Sami al Munais, who's one of the kind of best-known Kuwaiti oppositionist leaders at this point in time. So he noted that if permanent residents were given, if permanent residency was legalized, and permanent residents are given access to basically all the benefits of citizenship minus the vote, so uh, healthcare, education, property ownership, economic rights, et cetera, they would actually have exactly the same rights as second tier citizens, right? They would be exactly, it would be exactly the same. They would also have the same rights as first tier citizen women, right, who don't have the right to vote until 2005. Right? Which means that these struggles are interconnected. Right? The proposal to grant rights to one of these populations will have repercussions for all the others. If, if some non-citizens gain rights to permanent residency with all of these economic rights, would this provide ammunition to advocates for, say, women's suffrage or for people advocating an end to tiered citizenship? Right? Relatedly, would this undermine the relative voting power of first-tier citizens who have now monopolized pow voting power in the National Assembly at this point in time? Or would it disrupt the supply of cheap and structurally vulnerable non-citizen labor on which many employers were depending at the time? So the interrelationship of, this que of these questions, they were widely recognized. They provided opportunities for solidarity across the bounds of nationality. But they also uh, held the potential for the privileged to unite in defense of their political and economic interests. It is a double-edged sword for the movement at this point in time. So actually, some, some uh, supporters of opening the door for nationality opposed permanent residency on the grounds that it might be a way of avoiding mass natu naturalizations. Um, actually, al daesh uh, was, 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 was one person who kind of represented this danger. So in 1975, when it became increasingly clear the regime was not interested in sweeping reforms, he began to abandon his calls for naturalizing large numbers of people on the grounds it wasn't politically feasible. Instead, he suggested uh, a more accessible form of permanent residency, which could be a substitute that would bring the same kind of economic benefits. So al daesh right, is pitting residency against naturalization. He sees them as an as a, as intention. But for al Munais, as well as for many other, especially uh, left-wing activists at this period, the answer is actually more solidarity. So al Munais condemned tiered nationality as both unsustainable and unethical, he made many of the same uh, arguments of, uh, of racism that others were making. Um, and he called for an even broader reorganization of nationality legislation. And he actually attacked proposals to naturalize only long resident skilled Arab workers as both self-serving and discriminatory. Right? Naturalizing quote unquote skilled workers is only going to give employers another incentive not to train their workforce. Right? Instead of training workers, they'll just turn abroad and hire more. Right? This was one of his arguments. It also would bypass the people who needed nationality the most, right? who were most subjected to discrimination in the system. So instead, he, he called on the Planning Council to support the naturalization of people of all backgrounds, basically whoever deserved it. And interestingly, in this period, the National Assembly would follow his lead. 
1975, members of the National Assembly drafted a sweeping new nationality law. And this nationality law was paired with a new system of, of long-term residency. It basically provided a step-by-step -step process from arrival to, uh, to residency to naturalization that would completely configure the outlines of this Kuwaiti nationality regime. Some of the strongest advocates for reform came from the organized labor movement. So in addition to, uh, they have a number of campaigns running at this point in, in, in time, actually, that, that explicitly reference the position of non-citizens. There's a campaign to unify Kuwaiti labor law. At this point in time, there's three labor laws, one for the oil sector, one for the public sector, one for the private sector, that basically gives privileged rights to people in the citizen-dominated sectors, particularly the public sector, right, working for the state. They want to unify these laws so the uh, workers in the non-citizen-dominated private sector are not working in really kind of viciously exploitative conditions. So, so that's one campaign. They're also campaigning against the system of allowances, right, that grants special rights to citizens. Um, but at the same time, they are also engaging in these press debates and framing the nationality, uh, the nationality law and reform of the nationality law as a cause that was profoundly linked to their own. Now, because oil companies preferred to hire, hire workers um, from nomadic backgrounds, I talk about this in another part of the, of the manuscript, um, and because many of these former nomads are the population most left behind by nationality law, a large percentage of workers in the oil industry were themselves stateless. So actually, uh, one paper reported that many of these workers failed to apply for nationality kind of in the early years because they had access to social services from the oil company, right? So they had no reason to turn to the state um, for social services basically until it's too late. Um, and actually, the Kuwait Oil Company, which is the, the largest oil company in Kuwait um, at this time and to the present day, um, actually had so many stateless employees that in its lists of employees, like the spreadsheets it made, it actually listed Kuwaitis proven and Kuwaitis unproven as two different categories. Like, that's how many stateless people they have working for them. Um, so in 1968, uh, uh, a labor allied paper, the Vanguard, which has a quite prominent role in this, in this manuscript, um, published a pretty remarkable petition from 133 stateless uh, Kuwait oil company workers. So they described themselves as people of the desert, right, connecting themselves to these former nomads. Um, they explained that despite the fact that many of them had worked for the oil company for decades and had been born and raised in Kuwait, they were denied many of the benefits their long service should have brought because they didn't have Kuwaiti nationality. They were systematically paid lower wages. They were often hired on shorter-term contracts, not long-term permanent contracts. Um, and they were given fewer promotions and fewer raises than their citizen colleagues. They explained that while they knew that the door to nationality had now closed, um, in the late 60s, the nationality committees really weren't functioning very much, um, they asked the crown prince to kind of reconsider his decision and reopen the door of nationality in the name of justice. So by the late 1960s, the, the labor movement and its allies in the press were basically framing stateless oil workers as almost a, another figure of the sympathetic stateless person. Two incidents in 1971 really reiterated the connection between the labor movement and nationality reform. So in November, it became apparent that the Japanese oil company, um, which is working in the neutral zone, which is shared between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia in this funky shared, shared sovereignty situation, was basically taking advantage of the fact that many of its workers were stateless in order to fend off unionization. At this point in time, only Kuwaiti citizens can join unions unless you can prove that you've been working on the same job for five years, which is really hard to do. And even if you do join the union, you basically no protection from retaliation if you're a non-citizen. You can be fired and deported basically at will. So the, 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 the unions are dominated by citizens for precisely that region, reason, because of the vulnerability of non-citizens. This, this oil company is taking advantage of that, in effect, to make it impossible to, to, to create a union in the Japanese oil company. Um, now, in response to this, Hussein Sakar, who at this point in time is the president of the Kuwait Trade Union Federation, issued a statement that condemned the company for treating its workers like, and these are his words, foreigners in their own land, despite the fact that they were, again his words, 100% Kuwaiti. So for many stateless oil workers at the Japanese firm, one of their key demands is the provision of an educational allowance because their children were denied entry to Kuwaiti, the Kuwaiti public education system because they were, non they were not citizens either, right? Um, so they're actually in a structurally vulnerable, a particularly vulnerable posi position precisely because they're not Kuwaiti citizens. So these, these particular challenges that non-citizen workers face make plain the connection between labor and citizenship in this context. Now, also in the same year, also in 1971, in an effort to cut back on labor costs, the Kuwait oil company fired 250 non-Kuwaiti workers. They're, they're slowly reducing their workforce as they're constructing less and need fewer people. Um, but many of the people they fired were actually some of those uh, uh, Kuwaitis unproven, right? They're actually stateless people who have spent their entire lives in Kuwait. So not only did these people lose their jobs, right? 
They, they would struggle to find new jobs because they're undocumented, right? They lose access to fundamental social services that they got from the oil company and not the state. And um, uh, they're, they're, they, they can't leave, right? They're, they're trapped because they're stateless people. They can't actually leave the, the state of Kuwait. Um, so uh, also in response, Hussein Sagar, right, the president of the Union Federation, explained that unions had long argued that uh, since 1965, in effect, that all workers should be treated equally without regard to the nationality and without discrimination, as he would call it, based on nationality. And he, in response, he called for a fundamental change to nationality legislation and enforcement. At, at the same time, he actually also condemned the division of citizens into tiers as, as uh, against the principle of equality and called for the naturalization of workers, arguing that the, the state of Kuwait really needed it. So the plight of stateless people and this campaign for their rights in the 1970s eventually led the state to undertake a few selective reforms, um, most of which were targeted actually at one or more of these sympathetic figures of the stateless person. So in 1972, the National Assembly uh, inserted a paragraph into nationality law that uh, enabled the naturalization of stateless people in Kuwait who completed their high school education possessed no other nationality. Uh, this, and this actually gained the support even of the rather conservative and reactionary interior minister at the time. Um, and a couple of years later, in 1974, another committee was formed to study applications for nationality from long, long-time residents who had just demonstrated what were called tangible services to Kuwait. So you do, you do something great for Kuwait. You can potentially get nationality, right? Um, so by 1974, there were actually three lower-level nationality committees based on different articles of the law who were reviewing applications from different categories of the sympathetic stateless person. And then these eventually go to the, the higher nationality committee, which is actually chaired by the interior minister in person, uh, for approval. Um, and, and finally, in 1976, a fourth committee is formed to review the applications from these long-serving Bedouin police officers. So actually, the result of this is, is it's, it's, it's a direct response right, to the press debate at this time, to these figures of the sympathetic person that reformers are advocating, right, highlighting the significance of these critiques and of popular power in the press at this time. Um, but in the end, these modifications turned out to be little more than superficial. So the, the state, and particularly the interior ministry, which is generally quite conservative at this time, enforced stringent qualifications on naturalization. They insisted that only individuals with critical skills or who had rendered, quote, important services to Kuwait would be naturalized. When the naturalization of, quote, unquote, highly qualified Arabs begins in 1974, the committee re reviewed over 2,000 applications and granted 15 people nationality. That's 2,000 applications, 15 people are granted nationality. The devil's in the details. Nationaliza nationalizations approved by these committees remained only a trickle. Now, despite the fact that tens of thousands of stateless high school graduates had applied for nationality by 1975, a few hundred had become Kuwaiti. The High Nationality Committee continued to review applications throughout the 1970s, but numbers remained extremely limited, and these requirements for evidence to gain nationality remained incredibly high and arbitrary. So in comparison to the vast number of stateless people living in Kuwait at this time, the tiny number of naturalizations seemed really to make a mockery of the problem. And in fact, even as the regime is granting nationality to certain people, it's also the stripping the nationality of others. So in 1973, the regime denaturalized three men who were found to have obtained nationality through false testimony in the 1960s. And actually, investigations in following years uh, led to other cases of citizenship stripping, all on the charge that the accused had obtained nationality by false testimony or generally illegal means. At the same time, allies of the ruling family worked to position themselves as defenders of the integrity of the nationality regime, right? And encouraging people to, be, uh, to, to enforce nationality themselves and make sure the undeserving, uh, the undeserving don't apply and get it, right? And one uh, 1975 press conference, the interior minister actually called um, on Kuwaiti citizens to adapt the slogan, every citizen a watchman. This was like the, the, the uh, which was actually revived in the COVID era, somewhat fascinatingly. Um, but uh, this, was, this was the slogan that he encouraged everyone to take up at this time, right? So while the stripping of citizenship is, is widely seen by in, in, the, in the kind of the popular press and by ordinary people, which I'm a social historian, that's a compliment. Um, so by ordinary people, um, the stripping, it's, it's seen as unethical and unconstitutional. It still remains a powerful tactic of the regime. Um, so actually, even many of these, and I should also note to kind of um, uh, uh, to, uh, to add some nuance to this point, even many calls for reform came with qualifications, and often qualifications that, that implied a kind of hierarchy of preference or desirability based on class, gender, or place of origin. 
So many criticisms of the seeming arbitrariness of naturalization were complaining that it was easier for quote unquote foreigners to obtain nationality than quote unquote Arabs. Another huge point I'm happy to talk about later. Um, the stereotype of Bedouin backwardness often blighted calls for a more open national nationality regime as well. So, so, so some advocates warned that, uh, that, that these, these descendants of, of Bedouin, or the quote unquote sons of the desert, as they're often called, um, did not necessarily understand the true meaning of democracy. That's a quote from a contemporary newspaper article. And that therefore, the, the acquisition of voting rights would mean that, quote, the tribe will become the axis on which the political and social apparatus pivot. Right. Now, one of the most common caveats was class, and this was particularly true, I don't have time to discuss it here, but in the a debate over what was called the foreigner marriage crisis in Kuwait in the 60s and 70s, which is also a fascinating subject. Um, but um, class becomes a really key point here. So one representative article condemned the fact that a naturalized uh, Arab university pre professor was ineligible for, ele for elected office, right? Naturalized, second tier citizen. While at the same time, a lowly sweeper, a farash, uh, was eligible for higher office, right? And this is seen as a, you know, a travesty, right? So even a lot of these calls for naturalization and reform also were, were patterned on these other hierarchies, right? So they're not unalloyed. This popular rally, rally, rallying cry is nationality for those who deserve it. And this concept of deserving it often came with assumptions of hierarchy. The deserving were overwhelmingly, to be more specific, educated, wealthy Arab men. Right? Not for everybody, right? for, but for a lot of the supporters, and especially the more skeptical supporters of reform. But by early 1975, despite these caveats, it appears, the natu nat it appears that the nat National Assembly has reached something of a consensus for the need for nationality reform. So uh, nationality law was the subject of a string of parliamentary debates. It's widely discussed in the press. And nearly all observers seem to think that a change was in the offing. The only question was that what that change would be. As it happened, uh, this is not what happened. The hardline response of the state and especially the suspension of the Kuwaiti Constitution in 1976 proved just how wrong those expectations were. Um, so a, a quick couple of takeaways. Um, what I hope comes out of this discussion, number one is the significance of these popular movements as actors, right? Pushing back against this rentier narrative as the state is uh, overwhelming and powerful and driving the debate. In fact, as we see here, it is reacting to popular movements far and away, right? They are driving the debate. They are driving the discourse. I also hope for those um, those of you who do follow Kuwaiti politics in this room, however, uh, however big that number is, I don't know. But for those of you who follow Kuwaiti politics in this room, um, it could be a bit, a, bit, a bit grim at this point in time. But I hope that, that those of you who are kind of following um, this kind of strong reformist and anti-corruption movement that's been, well, always been there, really, but kind of ebbs and flows, uh, it might give a little more hope, right? Um, right now, there's a major, um, uh, a major effort on the, on the part of stateless people to win the right to citizenship. It's a hotly debated topic in, in Kuwait. And I hope this gives a little hope that there was, in fact, a time when many citizens rallied around uh, the idea of giving citizenship to stateless people, that this was a hugely popular idea in the 1970s, um, and that this kind of exclusionary system, uh, it, it's not destiny, right? It was a choice, um, and that choice could be different. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm excited to hear your comments and questions. Thanks for coming. The corruption of the system, in the 1950s, it was even worse. Like, kind of princes would kind of grant nationality to, like, friends or, uh, you know, employees or what have you, um, kind of on a, a totally random basis. And this became a, a major call for reform. And actually, this, again, kind of complicates the story of wanting to create nationality law. So actually, the, the, in the 50s, the Kuwaiti political opposition calls for a more uh, systematized and bureaucratized and just more formal system of nationality, not to exclude people, but to make the voting rolls more accurate and to take away the system of like corrupt, undemocratic patronage, right? This actually becomes one of the main reasons why, um, actually why the 59 law is written at all is because there's popular support for nationality law, precisely because the system is so messed up and corrupt. Um, so yes, that's essential, right? The committees I'm talking about are the way it's supposed to be, but there are all these extra national, or excuse me, extra legal 
really illegal naturalizations taking on at that point. So that's actually a really key point. And yes, I didn't have time to talk about it in this, but it's a really key point why people supported reform in the 1950s as well. Um, so yeah, that's a really key point. And as for the ideal citizen, um, another really key point, right? So and this depends on who you are, right? So a lot of um, um, uh, right, we're, we're talking about in the 1970s the kind of tail end of the Arab nationalist movement, but a lot of kind of long the the official A and M has been dissolved at this point in time. Um, but in the 60s in particular, there was a lot of like bluntly just vicious anti-Iranian racism, like really vicious anti-Iranian, like racialized cartoons, like really really nasty stuff. Um, Iranian immigrants were called infiltrators, right? They were framed as kind of puppets of the Shah. There's no distinction between the Iranian government, which is, um, well, I mean, justifiably seen to a certain extent as an imperial puppet, and all, but just ordinary Iranians who are immigrating to various parts of the Gulf. It's really quite nasty. Um, by the 1970s, that's starting to shift. Um, people are realizing in the, the Arab nationalist movement that by doing this, they're actually helping the deportation state that is coming back and kind of the backlash is hitting them. Um, there's more of an olive branch to more of these immigrants. But even in the 1970s, definitely uh, preference to, uh, yeah, preference to people of Arab descent, whatever that means, um, right? Um, contested category. Um, preference to uh, the educated and people seen as quote unquote valuable skilled workers. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, and, al and also there's kind of a hierarchy within Kuwaiti citizenship as well. Uh, based on, you know, if you're of nomadic or settled background, what family you're from, there's a whole kind of thing. This really comes out in marriage um, more than anything. I talk less about it in the manuscript because um, I don't talk, um, I do talk about cross-citizenship marriages, but not necessarily Kuwait marriage in Kuwait as much. But, but there is, uh, you know, a certain internal hierarchy, right? It, it depends on who you are, of course, and how much, how much currency you put into these things. But, um, but yes, you are, uh, that is a... Uh, an excellent, an excellent question, and, and this hierarchy, um, this kind of implied hierarchy, is really key at this point in time. Yeah. So thank you for that, for that question. Great. I've got a lot of uh, people who want to ask you questions, Ooh, and okay. not a ton of time. So I'm going to ask everyone just really stick to the one question thing. I mean, I'm going to take two at a time. I, I can also hang out afterwards too, so, if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I've got, uh, I've got Milad, Arthur, Shabar, and Lindsay right now on deck. So I'll ask them. Okay. So really quickly, I'm sorry that I have one. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the generalizability of not only your argument, but also the approach uh, to citizenship to, uh, to wider Middle East, if not necessarily wider. And of course, I'm thinking, like many others probably, about what's happening in Iran. And you, you very much emphasize agency of popular actors, uh, popular activists, civil society actors. So um, I'm wondering the kind of approach that emphasizes that, let's say, over let's say political, not necessarily an economic deterministic paradigm, but let's say political, theological sources of modern law or legality or a longer genealogy of citizenship that would, and nationhood, uh, what kind of um, insight that might yield uh, beyond the Kuwaiti case or the Gulf? Yeah. Okay. Did the Iraqi invasion influence this situation to any extent? OK, yeah. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, I'll answer that question. Yeah, it totally uh, blew up the situation. Uh, sorry, that was a terrible uh, verbal description. But it, it really transformed, it transformed the debate. And a lot of people were viewed as, as infiltrators in the aftermath. Um, a lot of reform proposals were kind of swept away. It was quite devastating to uh, reformists. Um, to reformist calls, and, and it generated a kind of panic about the wrong people getting nationality, or of like Iraqis sneaking back across the border. Um, so it was um, um, it was a moment of kind of popular backlash against against reform um, uh, in general. Um, so yes, I don't I don't touch on it in the manuscript, but it's a critical turning point. So so yeah, that is a, a key moment. Um, uh, generalizability, um, I firmly consider myself in the humanities, so I'm always skeptical about generalizability, but you're absolutely right. And you also, I think, perceptively seem to have noted in that question that scholars of Iran are some of the people doing some of the best pushing back against these narratives of economic inevitability, right? Um, especially as Iran is like the, the original home of rentier state theory, right? Um, it was originally right meant to explain Iranian politics. Um, but um, that's, uh, that's, that's starting to be eroded by a lot of people who work exactly on popular and other movements. I think, I think these issues have been unusually sidelined in the Gulf discourse because of the, just the prominence of rentier theory. And also, actually, I think it's disciplinary. 
like historians tend to be more skeptical of this. Political scientists tend to use it more, to be perfectly blunt. Um, not necessarily, and don't get me wrong, there's some really good work there. Um, uh, there's some very good work there. Um, and some work within yeah, the rentier framework is actually really helpful to our kind of understanding the region. Um, and, and again, there's been some critical voices in political science from the beginning. Like when Akruluk was writing criti critical work, like attacking rentier state theory in the 1990s as a political scientist, right? It's, it's not universal. Um, but I think it's also disciplinary. There aren't a heck of a lot of us historians running around doing this kind of thing. And so um, I think that has, has been a, a real part of it as well. So yeah, that's a really key point. And, and, and so yes, uh, Iranian studies has actually been quite, quite helpful to me. And I do think, but I do think it is something that should be questioned more and is being questioned more. There's kind of this new generation of, of critical work, especially on migration um, in the Middle East. The trick is, it is generally more contemporary. So you don't get necessarily, it's not universal. And actually, there have been, there's been some really good historical work. But a lot of it is, is more anthropological and contemporary and field work based, which is wonderful. Um, but you don't get that longer historical arc. Right, so I tried to do a kind of longer arc to get a sense of like how this exclusion emerges emerges over time, and it changes dramatically over time. Right, um, this is a more hopeful moment in the '70s. Um, it gets it gets uh, honestly more depressing, but um, but uh, it does give you a sense that uh, that yeah, it is it is something I think um, could be talked about more and, and should be challenged should be challenged more. This presumed inevitability of citizenship, like challenging the inevitability of the nation state form. Right, a kind of that's, that's a Frederick Cooper move. Right, but. Um, so I think I think it, I think it, people are starting to do this, but 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 yeah, could be done more, and is particularly neglected in the Gulf. I think I don't think we have anyone beating down the door, so we can maybe hang out for a little bit. Uh, we have uh, Sheda and then Lindsay and then maybe Let's see how. We Alex, thank you so much for your fascinating talk and your great research. You mentioned uh, the citizens who, in the late 1960s, received uh, even further. Treatment, better treatment by the regime and the Anglo-American oil companies, and they didn't accept it. So I'm wondering about the forms of objection or rejection or, and the extent of resistance to the privileges that were given to them, and what were the privileges? That's a great question and a really touchy point. Um, this is uh, To call it this the third rail of Kuwaiti politics is the understatement of the century. I think it's a really touchy point. Um, um, it really starts in the 60s with the granting of these special allowances. This is actually, I mean, this is a class, as, you know, I'm a labor historian, this is a classic strategy, right? Grant special privileges to some workers and not others. Even allowances, the term itself, is what the French use in West Africa to discriminate against uh, black workers as opposed to French workers, actually. It's like a classic strategy. Um, I, uh, the oil companies blame the state for initiating this, and the state blames the oil companies in a lot of the records, which is kind of funny. Um, but it becomes standard practice in the, late, in the late 60s. So basically, you get a chunk of money if you've got a family and you're a Kuwaiti citizen. You get a family allowance. Um, there were other allowances in the oil industry, like a danger allowance if you're doing something dangerous, or you know, a, a, I forget, well, what's it called? A, a desert allowance or something if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're living in a not very exciting. Thing. Oh, yeah, hazard, well, hazard pay. Hazard pay uh, it's called a danger allowance. Yeah, yeah, but the exact same thing. Yeah, exact same thing. Um, so these exist. Um, um, but um, the labor movement immediately sees this as a threat to its unity. Um, in the 60s, um, it critiques it. Um, but um, it's not totally central. But in the 70s, there are actually a number of strikes in the oil industry with the, the, like, the selective and discriminatory issuing of allowances were a central issue. The thing is, they lose a lot of these strikes. They actually cave, and they, the company successfully pressures them to accept special allowances for Kuwaitis. Now, sometimes they're able to win. Like sometimes the, the, the company proposes big allowances for Kuwaitis, nothing for anyone else, and they win like some allowances for non-citizens, right? Or like they bridge the gap a little bit, but but they lose a lot of these strikes. What they win is oil nationalization, which is I mean a massive world historical shift that probably is Project Two, but um, they win some pretty significant things, um, but but they lose. Um, they cave in the end. Um, uh, they they feel they can't win it. They don't have the political support. They can win on nationalist issues, but but not on that. Um, and, and that is kind of that, that's basically the other chapter that's going along alongside this, right? And it's ex right, it's explosive, right? Oil workers go on strike; they shut down the Kuwaiti economy. This is not a minor thing, right? They wield a lot of power at this point in time. Um, so the fact that we're willing to threaten strikes and go on strike over this is pretty remarkable. Um, but they lose, and this is exactly the period in which they lose. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe we can take Lindsay and the questions together. We know that, that other Arabs, we call them Palestinians, Syrians, Egyptians, are really 
in a large part responsible for like modern education, bringing modern education to Kuwait, for like what Arab nationalism looks like in the Gulf in general. I'm curious to know if the leaders, especially in the early years amongst these oil workers, are in fact the same kind of educated uh, Arabs who are who are bringing their this kind of politics to Kuwait and like is there a point when it becomes Kuwaiti or is this are they really the mouthpieces and the Kuwaitis are sort of working for them? Yeah, key, yeah. I, I mean, Lindsay knows the the, the region. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Great question. Uh, yeah, um, that is a great question. Um, so. Um, a lot of the oil workers are actually of Bedouin descent from Kuwait originally, and they end up becoming the people, especially the oil workers who lead the movement. So they're not necessarily the people who have like, you know, gone to high school in Cairo or something. They're generally not. They're actually from Kuwait. But they are really, really connected to the people who have. Um, so the, the Kuwaiti trade union movement is basic, basically birthed in the independence club in Kuwait, which is kind of a, a center of Arab nationalist and anti-colonial activism. They're advised by members of the Arab nationalist movement. They're closely connected to the Arab nationalist movement. And they actually see the Egyptian la labor movement as something of a model to follow. Um, so they're in touch with Egyptian trade union leaders. They go to conferences there all the time. This is part of a general thing, which um, uh, for, for uh, <laughs> For Egyptians at this point in time, the Gulf was seen as kind of a, a kind of backward place to civilize to a certain extent. It's a brief summary of this, but um, a lot of Egyptian experts are in, in the region who are you know, teaching or writing the constitution or doing other really essential work. Um, uh, and so uh, they're generally not leading the movement. It's really the oil workers who are generally born in Kuwait and, and not, not elite. A lot of them are actually from, like, like uh, former sailors or um, from Bedouin. A lot, of, a lot of them, are, most of them are from Bedouin backgrounds because of the workforce. Um, the oil company hires former nomads because they think they won't go communist is the short reason um, for this. Yeah, so that's generally his leading the movement. But you're absolutely right. They're intimately connected to these movements. They're meeting these movements. They're getting advice from these movements. They're fundamental parts of the Arab nationalist movement. They see themselves as part of that, um, of that kind of trend. Um, uh, and so there's this kind of quiet, essential kind of background thing um, of, of, of connection, even if it's not exactly the same people. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for the, for the question. No no? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then, uh, please uh, join me in, in thanking you. Thank you for coming.